put your thinking caps on folks. I'm going to blow your mind. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. we'll be chatting about the potential danger of intermittent fasting on women's hormones. But first, let me tell you about my sponsor, iHerb. So I know from my SIBO saga that trying to track down all the right supplements in one place can feel like a full-time job in itself. So iHerb makes this process so much easier with over 30,000 products, including supplements, sports nutrition, beauty, bath, grocery, baby, and pets. I also love that you can check the product's expiration date before you buy. You can make sure that you get the lifespan that you need. Plus they have their own in-house line that's being third-party tested, which is key, and you get a 90-day money-back guarantee. And if you have any questions about products or supplements, they have a support line open five days a week in 10 different languages, so it makes finding the right product so much easier. And if you use supplements regularly like I do, they have a members rewards program that lets you cash out for every hundred dollars in credits that you earn. So you can either review products that you bought, answer questions from customers, or refer friends or family. So in my haul, I got the Pez Science Vegan Protein, which I definitely wanted to try myself because I do love their whey protein. I got California Gold Prebiotic Fiber, which is key for regularity and my SIBO protocol. I got some melatonin, which I use nightly for sleep. I got Now's Ultra Omega-3s, which is key for brain and heart health. And I got California Gold's vitamin D3 for bones and my immune system. These are some of the core products that I buy regularly. So I'm just so happy that I can find them all in one place. So if you want to check this out yourself, you can use my promo code Abby to get 20% off of your order. And as always, feel free to pause the screen or look at the description, including a big trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating. We will be discussing calorie deficits and weight loss. So as always, feel free to skip this video if it's not supportive to your journey. And if you are new here, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, ring that bell, and follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Abby's Kitchen. If you missed my overview of the literature on intermittent fasting for weight loss, you can check that video out right here. But this is a huge topic that I cannot possibly unpack in its entirety in one video. So today we're going to specifically address the impact of fasting on women's hormones and answer the age old question, is this diet even safe? And I'm going to warn you now, this is a more high level concept. So put your thinking caps on now. Also, when I'm speaking to the safety of this diet, I'm going to for a moment put aside the psychological or emotional or mental risks or dangers associated with dieting. I'm going to assume for the purposes of this video that dieting, or in this case, intermittent fasting as a diet, is psychologically appropriate for you. So my discussion of the safety profile is speaking specifically to the physical safety or the risk for hormonal health. First, a quick little recap on intermittent fasting. So while results vary person to person, the literature suggests that intermittent fasting can result in weight loss across the lifespan. So we have studies ranging from premenopausal to postmenopausal women, and of course also men. However, there's nothing magical about fasting for weight loss compared to other diets. In fact, research suggests that it's really no more effective than classic continuous caloric restriction. Ultimately, when we skip a meal, we're just kind of bad at making up for those calories in full. But is it a less safe diet for women than counting calories or points? Well, if you're a person who menstruates, you'll know and agree that we really don't want to mess with normal hormonal function. Honestly, hormones cause enough trouble on a good day. No one wants to poke that bear. So is intermittent fasting off the table for us gals? Let's take a look at the facts. I spoke with my colleague, Eric Williamson over at Unlocked Fitness and Nutrition, who expertly explained the link between intermittent fasting and hormonal imbalance in his Facebook intermittent fasting video series. Now, while the premise of intermittent fasting is to simply shorten your eating window, it generally results in two main side effects that have implications for body weight 
and hormones. That is number one, we end up just eating fewer calories overall. And number two, we end up eating fewer meals or snacks in the day. So as we already established, it's actually side effect number one that is responsible for weight loss. And I'm gonna explain the implications for number two, the number of meals in a minute number two. But first, let's discuss the concept of energy availability and how it relates to diets like intermittent fasting. So most people, when they talk about weight loss, they talk about energy balance, which is just basically calories in minus calories out. But this doesn't account for metabolic changes that act on real time changes in energy intake and expenditure. So energy availability also focuses on energy requirements, breaking them into two main components energy for exercise and movement and energy for health and vitality. When there is low energy availability, your body can start to downregulate functions for your health to deal with the deficit, some of which are in my books kind of essential. Perhaps you're right. So energy availability can be calculated across the day, but it can also be calculated down to each hour of the day. So we often discuss this in the literature as within day energy balance. So to recap, this is the simplified energy balance equation, and this is the within day energy balance equation. So as a simplified example that my colleague Eric gave me, let's say someone eats 400 calories at 12 o'clock and then burns through 700 calories by three o'clock. This means at three o'clock, they would be in a negative energy balance by about 300 calories and have low energy availability. Now, what we know is that for women, more hours of the day spent in an energy availability below minus 300 calories is associated with menstrual dysfunction and hormonal irregularities. So if we put this into layman's terms, this is the critical threshold where on average, a diet can become potentially hormonally unsafe for the average female. Now, I wanna reiterate that I'm not saying that a 300 calorie daily deficit is necessarily dangerous. It might be, but that's a different term than the 300 calorie within day energy deficiency that I'm actually referring to. I know it's complicated and this is not something that we can easily calculate on MyFitnessPal, so like don't even try. But this is why having a skilled dietitian on board is really, really key. It's also important to flag that we can all handle dipping below the critical threshold occasionally because maybe we got busy at work and we skipped a meal or maybe because we feel so sick that we can't eat for an extra few hours one day. Our bodies can recover from that kind of occasional blip. But hormonal problems really arise when we have chronically low energy availability in the day. Very, very dangerous. Now, it's important to note that the female reproductive system is very sensitive to energy imbalances and losing too much weight or being underweight has absolutely been shown to negatively impact fertility. So we've talked about hypothalamic amenorrhea in my video right here, but this is the most severe form of menstrual disturbances associated with infertility and is also commonly associated with dieting and disordered eating. Basically what happens is that chronic low energy availability can disrupt gonadotropin releasing hormone, which then has a domino effect on estrogen and progesterone, potentially halting reproduction. So research suggests that gonadotropin releasing hormone levels actually drop by about 20 to 30% within just two to three days of calorie deprivation. So this actually can happen quite fast. We also know that prolonged fasting periods of around 72 hours can cause an endocrine response similar to that seen in hypothalamic amenorrhea. And one of the reasons for this seems to be linked to our satiety hormone leptin. So leptin is not only important for regulating our appetite, but it is key for reproduction through its relationship with LH release. So in the research, we see that low levels of leptin are associated with reduced fertility and increased rates of miscarriage. Bottom line here, folks. And that's the bottom line. We want to maintain healthy levels of leptin through adequate body fat and adequate body weight, 
because that's imperative if a healthy pregnancy is the eventual goal. Now, some of you might say, I don't want kids, so why should you care about not having a cycle? Well, without adequate estrogen levels to sustain a period and ovulation and therefore a pregnancy, we also increase our risk of low bone density, suppressed bone strength, and risk of fractures. One study found that it took as little as five days of not eating enough to affect our bones. And if you continue to overeat, this can lead to irreversible reductions in bone mineral density. So not to be a total Debbie Downer, but if you're over the age of 30 or even 25, it's all kind of downhill from here in the bone department. There are no more opportunities to bank more bone later on. Oh. 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 Yes, well, uh, that can sometimes happen. So again, this is why it's critical to catch and reverse this hormonal downregulation super early on in life. Okay, and then what about those of you who don't want kids, don't care about your bone health for some reason, or maybe don't have female hormones to contend with at all? Maybe you just want to lose weight and intermittent fasting works for you. Well, here's the inconvenient truth. Spending a lot of time under this critical threshold is associated with lower than expected RMR or resting metabolic rates in non-menstruating folks. And in severe cases, we see completely devastating effects on metabolic hormones. So things like our satiety hormone leptin tanks, our stress hormone cortisol and our hunger hormone ghrelin increases, and our thyroid hormones get all out of whack. Essentially, our metabolism slows down in an effort to conserve energy to just keep us alive. Meanwhile, with a suppressed resting metabolic rate and a raging appetite, we burn fewer calories at rest and we want to eat all the things. So despite our best efforts, weight loss slows and we can actually put weight on. In fact, some research suggests that our RMR can actually drop as much as 400 fewer calories when we're chronically eating, which means you're burning 400 fewer calories less every day. So spending time under the critical threshold not only sucks for morale if weight loss is your goal, but it also can have the complete opposite effect as your goal. So does this mean that you cannot eat in a caloric deficit and try to lose weight? without risking hormonal imbalance? Well, the key here, folks, is to avoid spending a lot of time below your critical threshold. So to recap in normal words, hormonal disturbance is not only about the daily caloric deficit we calculate on like a stupid online app, but is also to do with a much more complicated calculation of how much time you're spending in a suboptimal state of energy availability every day where your body doesn't have enough calories on board in that hour to maintain health and vitality. So yes, a modest deficit and weight loss pace is important here, but it's not just about total calories because you can actually dip below the critical threshold without a calorie deficit at all. It's about how often and for how long your tank is on empty each day, AKA, the within day energy deficiency. And this is where the unique danger of intermittent fasting comes into play. Intermittent fasting often encourages you to go long stretches of time without eating, sometimes during which you're exercising and expending a lot of energy. If you're concerned about happy hormones, which I think we all should be, my colleague Eric suggests that it's often safer to eat a few smaller meals spaced out throughout the day rather than relying on one or two large meals later on in the day, which ironically is kind of what many intermittent fasting regimens prescribe. Essentially what you want to do is give your body small bursts of energy so that each time it starts reaching that critical threshold, it's lifted up enough for you to make it to your next meal. And by doing this, you'll keep your energy levels above the critical threshold while still maintaining a safe and modest caloric deficit. So does that mean all intermittent fasting regimens are unsafe for women. Here's the thing. Obviously it's impossible to make a blanket statement that any one way of eating is going to be safe or healthy for 50% of the population. And I'm not even going to get into the mental or emotional or psychological risks or dangers of dieting, period. That's a whole other conversation and I'm going to assume for the purposes of this video that weight loss is deemed 
appropriate. But some methods of fasting will likely be more or less physically risky for the masses. For example, whole day and alternate day fasting will probably result in eating way too few calories and more time being spent under the critical threshold every day. And this is bad news bears in general, but specifically for women who are already relatively lean, exercise a lot, or who are trying to conceive now or in the future. So when I asked Eric if there was a universally safe intermittent fasting protocol for women, of course his response was, it's very difficult to answer. And of course it is. I mean, humans are all unique. So for Eric, this really depends on how much someone eats, when they eat, how many feedings they have in the day, when they exercise and how much, and whether their daily total is in an energy balance or a significant deficit. This is complicated shit and also really points to why it's ideal to have a dietitian on board to help. So in an effort to clarify again, bottom line, generally speaking, Eric says that most women should stick to no more than a 12 to 16 hour fast max, and where your safe number lies will depend on a few factors. If you're having fewer meals in the day, if you're in a caloric deficit, aka trying to lose weight, if you're exercising heavily, or if the majority of your calories are happening at the end of the day, you'll want to limit your time in that fast to the more modest 12 hours to be safe. In conclusion, chronic undereating can lead to a variety of hormonal disturbances that can cause a host of health problems down the line. Intermittent fasting will not necessarily put you under the critical threshold or put you at risk of hormonal damage, but depending on when, what, and how much you eat, the risk is higher than if you were to eat meals spaced more evenly throughout the day. Weight loss without reproductive or hormonal damage is of course possible, but a less is better approach will always risk more harm. So as always, definitely reach out to a registered dietitian who specializes in weight loss and hormonal health because this is far more complicated than what any influencer online suggests. I mean, if the complexity of this video didn't illustrate that, I'm not sure what will. And on that note, that is all that I have for you guys today. If you like this video, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on what or who you'd like to see me discuss next. Subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye!